Welcome back, everybody. This is a continuation, um, a kind of a filling in the blanks of some of the presentation that Dr. Steers and I presented at the recent OD meeting in Dallas. Um, I know we uh, did our best to run through everything, and I, I think Dr. Steers did a fantastic job talking about some of the bigger picture items, how to interact with the patient, um, how that connection with the patient, especially with the CVCT in front of them, the imagery in front of them, can be very powerful with co-diagnosis. Um, I feel like there's some information I wanted to add to my part of the presentation that there were a lot of questions about and we didn't quite get time to get there. So that's what this um, is. This is kind of a makeup session, if you will. Um, just as a recap, Dr. Pham originally put this material together. Um, so this generally is his slideshow with some adjustments from Dr. Steers and myself. So we're going to go ahead and, and pop through real quick the slides that Dr. Steers went through. Of course, here's our learning objectives. Why now? You know, obviously co-diagnosis, the power of CBCT allowing us to really connect to the whole body health in our goal to serve our patients. The workflow that Dr. Steers went through, fantastic. Um, uh, it's great that PDS has put this together for us. This is, this is valuable information. Prescription forms, one of the things that uh, Dr. Steers talked about and, and that I mentioned as well. Initially, you know, we have this machine here. Um, initially, when we got our machine, I had one of these on every clipboard for every patient. Um, I wanted to fill that out. I wanted to sign it down here um, just so that I got in the habit of, of telling the assistants, this is what I want, this is why I want it. Um, and we would scan that in the patient's chart. I don't use that anymore. I just give them a verbal order um, unless this is an outside referral. So if you have a patient come in from outside, an outside office, a non-PDS or within PDS office, I want this documented. Um, so that the, you know, we, we cover, cover our liability issues just, just so that the, if someone were able to look at the records, um, who ordered this and why did they order this? Well, it wasn't ordered by me. We just have the machine. We were facilitating the other doctor's request. So let me mention for you, for me, on almost every scan, almost every patient that comes in that needs a CBCT, um, I'm going to take a full scan at 8x15 on high resolution. So according to my calculations, it's about between 70 and 80 microsieverts of radiation for that full scan high resolution. It's in the middle 50s for a standard, but you get a much cleaner image with high. So let's talk a little bit about that. So Dr. Steers talked about liability. You can see these links will take you directly to the PDS website. You'll have to use your login um, to get to this document. That's where this is. Um, here's some of the clinical assessment stuff. All of these are active links, and I'll show you where these are here in just a second. And then Dr. Steers went through um, talking about discussing with the patient in front of the, you know, in front of the patient in this particular case. I should note that this is CBCT training number 15. If you have a CBCT machine in your office in DTX Studio, you, ha you should have this particular file there. Now let's, let's look at this a little bit. You can see how grainy this is. Um, this is a, a low resolution or a standard resolution um, image. So I usually take the high, so it's a much cleaner image. For surgery, for even for implants, this level of imagery would be plenty sufficient. And for a lot of issues, this would give you diagnostic capability for, a, you know, with that particular image quality. But I usually take the high, like I said before. So let's dig just a little bit in now. Um, we're going to review through some CBCT training cases here in just a second. But I wanted to talk about where some of these resources are. So. You have a CBCT home page, okay? When you, when you go to PDS Connect and you log in, you know, I'm logged in here, you click on this clinical button, and under the drop-down there is a CBCT. Click on that, it takes you here. Um, most of the resources that I find the most helpful are actually under this training drop-down. So when you click here or there, it expands open and gives you a training, um, a training resource. So let's see if it works here. I'm going to open this. All right, so this is the website, the PDS Connect website. Hopefully you can see all that. Uh, clinical CBCT right here. That's going to take us directly to that landing page and this uh, screenshot kind of, or this picture kind of cycles. Here are all the resources, right? Um, resources and training. This is where most of the relevant data that I use is. And I have a Cavo machine, the Cavo OP3D Pro, so my machine is here, all the resources here. Um, the FAQ, I pulled this up for some of you, has all of these really great links in it. 
Um, it also has, if you need it, the radiographic prescription forms, and all this stuff is right here, which is fantastic. Um, Beam Readers is super duper easy and simple to use. Um, I may have mentioned in the lecture that I use Beam Readers um, perhaps once, maybe even twice uh, per week. We're sending a lot of scans up there. I think it's important that we have access to them. So there are plenty of resources. That's uh, what I was just showing you. All these resources, there are tons and tons and tons of resources. If you haven't spent the time getting, getting to know the CBCT landing page, take some time. Um, you know, again, it's, it's under your PDS Connect login, go to clinical, go to CBCT, boom, there's all the resources you could possibly need um, with some more data around there that you can look at. Okay, so get familiar with this. There's a lot of good stuff. Beam readers questions, it's all right here. There's some walkthroughs. I'll show you how to do this. Um, if you want to upload a beam readers case, um, it's very simple. There are a couple of things you'll need to do and this will walk you through how to do it. But let me just show you, I'm gonna pull up DTX if I can find it over here. So here is DTX. I'm just gonna search for one of these um, training vids here. So here's CBC training number five. If I wanted to send this one to Beam Readers, there are a couple things I would have to do. The first thing I have to do is export the data. Okay? So you got to export it, and I have to export it to somewhere, right? We got to put this somewhere. You can put it on the desktop, you can put it in the documents, you can put it in downloads, wherever you want to put it, you can put it there. But you have to turn off anonymize. Turn this off. Because Beam Readers, once you upload an anonymized file, will email you back two or three days later and say, hey, I can't, I can't give you a report because I don't know who it is. So deselect that, export it, and these are all the images. This is the CBCT. These images are screen snaps, um, or screenshots rather, of, of images that I've taken in the software. So you don't have to upload up, upload or export these. You can just upload the CBCT itself in this DICOM format. But once you export it, it'll export to wherever it exports. Poof, right? It's exporting. And it doesn't usually doesn't take very long. Now if it's if the file is saved in a server, it might take a little bit for that to, to download locally. Um, but then that's exported, right? It's gone. So we can close out of this and then we can go to Beam Readers. And Beam Readers is super easy to use. This is the main landing page. It's going to ask me to log in. I am going to cheat and use my fingerprint because I'm on a Mac. And then if I want to, I can add a new case. So at this point, um, date of birth, scan date, we'll put it as today. Referring doctor, if you have multiple doctors in your practice, you can add doctors. Um, and then you want to hit continue. Um, you have to select something. If you want to add notes, uh, upper left maxilla for possible pathology or whatever. You can also click pathology or general or airway or sinus. And then when you hit continue, You'll, you'll come to the option where you can pick what you want. Usually this is what I use. I haven't ever ordered a rush. Um, next step, you'll upload the file. When you click on that, you navigate to where the file was, where you saved it, when you exported it from DTX Studio, um, and then that goes up to the cloud, and you hit submit, and then you get a, a page that says leave this page while we're uploading, um, and then you'll get a confirmation at the end. So it's really simple. And then once once they review it, you'll get an email back to whatever email address you've put in Beam Readers, um, and they'll have a report for you. Um, I would suggest, you know, for, for many of you know this, currently um, there's an ongoing special with Beam Readers um, th that our company has an agreement with. For 60 days, you get 60, 60 free reads um, of CBCT images. Um, take advantage of that, not that you want to overload them. Certainly if there's something, you know, you feel comfortable knowing that that's a periapical abscess or this is a, you know, sinus inflammation, you don't need to inundate them with, you know, things that aren't helpful for your practice. 
Um, but take advantage of, meaning avail yourself of this opportunity. Um, don't let it slide by. Okay, so we talked about the resources, talked about Bernie and his awesome mittens. Um, let's talk a little bit about radiation. So it's important that we understand that anytime we expose our patients to radiation, whether it's you know a CBCT radiation or whether it's panoramic radiation or intraoral radiation, um, it's additive. Radiation has effects um, on people. Um, according to my simple calculations, being a tooth guy, not a radiation physicist, um, this is what I came up with based on some standard information. Um, an FMX, roughly 15 microsieverts. Now this is effective dose, not actual dose. These absorbed dose could be different. Um, panoramic film, roughly, and this is for a Kodak machine, if I remember right. Um, our 8x15, which is the biggest um, excuse me, field of view that our machine can capture on standard is 52 microsieverts of radiation and then four bite wing films. Now if you're taking anterior pH, you also have to add excuse me, add that to the to the list because it's important that we're, we're, we're precise here, right? Um, so for me, I normally order four bite wings couple of anterior PAs, I want to see all the interproximal, whether they can get it with two or they have to do three. Sometimes we can get it with one, which is amazing, but not very often. Four bite wings and full set of photos. So this is very comparable. 51 for old school pano and 18 films, or 55 for a set of bite wings uh, and a, a standard resolution CBCT, which gives you 600 different slices, 600 slices um, to look through for a CBCT on high on a standard res. So, gives you a lot more data for a nominal increase in radiation. For me personally, I as I mentioned before, I use the uh, high res setting, um, which gives you about 40% more radiation, I was told by the tester that came out who tested all the settings, he said 40% more. So 40% more, you know, you're in the 70s now, 70 to 80, depending on the dosage. This is what my machine looks like. Um, right here, you know, this is the wide-angle lens. We have the OP3D Pro, which allows us Ceph functionality and panoramic functionality. I think most of the machines have the pano functionality. You can take a conventional panoramic, regular pano with a CBCT, regular pano with a CBCT. Um, so if you have a pediatric patient, you don't want a full 3D pano, you can take a conventional 2D pano with a CBCT. So that, that was a common question. Well, do we have to take the full 3D with all the radiation for a pediatric patient? No, you just click pan right here. Click pan and take a regular pano and you'll see the conventional pan setting and then you go in and you adjust the whatever based on the patient size. For me, we have another pano machine that's across the room from this. Uh, we moved our old pano into the other room and now I have the CBCT so I could take two simultaneous 2D panos if I wanted to. Anyway, so 3D, one of the things that I would suggest you get familiar with is this button, this A button. You know, it's down there somewhere, you can't see it. A stands for automatic. When we were trained, we were trained to put it on M and then adjust the exposure based on the patient's head size. Um, I didn't learn this until later reading through the manual that A stands for automatic. If you put it on automatic, after you've got the patient positioned and everything set up right, and this is high res, by the way, standard and low, low, standard, high, um, if you put it on A, what will happen is uh, as you hit the, the acquire button, the machine will position so that it's right straight through the patient anterior posteriorly. And it'll take a quick exposure and it'll gauge how much radiation it needs to give you a clear image. And then it adjusts itself. And then it'll cycle back and then it starts going through the cycle. So use the A. Use A, right? Um, it saves me so much, I don't know, frustration and stress because the images come out a lot clearer when it's on automatic and when it's on high. But you have to make sure your patients hold still. And just like with panos, it's, it's better if they're holding, they're snugging onto these little handles and they're leaning back just slightly. You don't want them leaning forward too much, leaning back just slightly. It should also uh, be mentioned that I don't use um, any uh, cotton in the mouth. I used to, I don't use it anymore. I just have the patient gently hold their teeth together, swallow, hold your tongue to the roof of your mouth. Real simple. Uh, when, when we used a bunch of cotton, we'd get all this shadowing and beam hardening and scatter. I don't, just don't use the cotton anymore. Okay, 
So let's look at a couple of cases here. Um, I want to give you, let's go to number nine here. I think this will probably be the most helpful to go through a series of steps. Um, Dr. Steers took care of the uh, the kind of the nuts and bolts of, of broad overview. Let me talk with you about some of the specifics. Now this case has some pathology. It's a pathology that doesn't need treatment per se, but it has some pathology um, to look at. I'm going to make this the same size as the window of the screen that I'm recording, so give me just a second. All right. So I, when I have time, I like to spend a couple of minutes beforehand reviewing what's going on um, on the patient's CBCT before I come into the room. Oftentimes I don't have time. So I'll ask the uh, assistants to open up DTX Studio Diagnose, not, um, I'm sorry, DTX Studio, whatever this is, not Diagnose. I want them to open the studio, not Diagnose, right? Um, because if, if they open up Diagnose, I have to force unlock it, and that creates synchronization errors and slows your machi machines down. So don't open Diagnose in, unless you're sitting in front of the CBCT. And this is Diagnose. This is the interface you're seeing now. So this screen sh comes up, right? Um, let's walk through creating a 3D panoramic. So you can see the panoramic right here. Um, let's redo this. Um, boop, boop. Okay, so when you get uh, to 3D pan, you will click on 3D pan and you'll see this screen, right? Now it's important to note that you can screen cycle up and down through the 3D pan and pick what you want to pick with regard to where it's easiest for you. Um, I'm going to move my head out of the way for just a second. Okay, so you can see it's asking me to indicate the region of the right third molar. So I'm going to click once on the right third molar. Click. Now I have to indicate the region of the right canine. Now I have to move my head again. Sorry. We're going to go to the right canine. Now we're going to go to the left canine. And now we're going to go to the third molar again. OK. So a couple of things. You can add dots. You can see we're missing a portion here. And I can. This red line that you see here only indicates the slice that I'm looking at. It doesn't mean anything except this is the slice you're currently looking at, right? Now I can go down here and I can bring these dots in if I want to, or I can add some dots. It's a little bit more precise to add dots. Now you see this patient has a pretty uh, anterior flare to her T, so I'm gonna click and it'll give me another dot and I'm gonna slide that out a little bit. And I'm gonna click again and it'll give me another dot and then I'm gonna adjust that a little to match better the patient's profile. And in a perfect world, you could, I mean, theoretically, you could go in and you could put a dot on every single tooth if you had the time or wanted to. Um, the challenge that we've got with this particular patient is we're trying to get a 2D panoramic out of a 3D film for someone that has very pronathic teeth, very pronathic jaws. Um, so again, we can cycle this up and down through where we want to view on the left side with this scroll bar on the right side of the screen. So generally, if we're looking at, you know, the, the patient's jaw, this to me would be acceptable on the right. So I'm going to hit done, and now we have an image. Now, it's a little blurry, right? Uh, so let me show you my favorite tool over here. It's this little carrot, this little arrow. Click on this. Just ignore the nerve. We'll talk about that in a minute. Turn on the crisp, and then you can drag that up and really sharpen those images. That helps a lot, right? Really sharpen that. So there's the crisp on and off and on and off. There are a couple other ways you can help to adjust this. You can increase some contrast and brightness. But the 3D pan, because of the slice, I tend to turn on that crispness a little bit. All right. So for me and my oral surgeon and whoever I'm sending this patient to because of what we got going on around here, um, this image would be sufficient. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. We'll, I'll show you how to map that nerve here in just a second. So that's a decent pano, right? Now you'll notice the right side and the left side are a little bit different, so I'm going to adjust that. You can see, let me move my head out of the way again. If I want to, I can actually move these guys 
out so we get a little more even left to right. That looks a little better. Now I can even move it a little bit more. Sorry, my floating head there. If I wanted to, there you go. Hit done. There you go, a little more even. And you can go back and edit this. You just go into Edit 3D Scan and change the OPG curve. Now, one of the first steps is positioning this in, in the right way. So I'm going to update this, right? So you'll notice we got a whole lot of scatter. This is scatter. It could be from the patient moving. Now let's look at, you see that patient's head is down. So if you end up getting having a hard time, kind of like we did at the beginning, you want to adjust this. So we have some adjustment here. You can rotate the patient back like this. And watch what my mouse does as I move up and down. You see now I can rotate on the axial plane here. And then up, I'm rotating in the coronal plane right and then on this side there's the axial again and then we'll go to sagittal so there's the sagittal plane and then we can pan bring that back down all right now watch i bet that what we just did will give us a little bit little better film to work with so it's, you see it's a little bit simpler a little bit clearer i think anyway lots of tools okay we're not going to talk about tmj we're not going to talk about ceph um, let me show you how to map a, uh, an IA nerve. So dental implants are the greatest thing in the world. I would encourage you to get trained, get comfortable placing dental implants, um, especially all you associates who are interested out there. So this to me looks a little bit blurry, right? So we can hit our favorite button, the carrot button. Um, we can go to crisp. We can turn on some sharpness if you want to. Don't overdo it, right? Keep it casual. Um, So what I'm going to do first is I want to know exactly for myself where that IA nerve is. So I'm going to go all the way back, see if I've got where it exits. Okay, so we can see where it exits. And then a couple of things. I'm going to go to Diagnose, right? I'm going to change my thickness, make that really thick. I could actually hide that. So we know here is where the IA curve is, right? I can see it tracing down through, and you can kind of follow it once you get it going. So I'm going to start right here. I'm going to use the pen. You can see there are little dots that are connected. We're going to click on that. I'm going to click right here. Click once. Now you'll notice it stays attached and just like Sarek, you can pan through it as you go. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to click again. Now I'm going to use my, my arrow, my up and down arrow. Right now I'm on the down arrow. I'm just cycling down and I'm going to continue to click periodically. You don't have to click too often if you've got a really straight line. Now if you've got curves, you're going to want to add some curves or add some dots in between the uh, what am I trying to say click more frequently if there are curves um, that way you get a little more precise curvature so to be honest you know it, depending on what area of the mouth you're mapping you don't have to map the entire um, nerve if you're just looking at where third molars are you can map that you can train your assistants to map that. Now we're coming out. So, all right, that's good enough for me. All right, so I'm going to right click. You can see the indicator right here on where I'm moving. Right click, and then we can double click and it'll pull it up in the other images. Uh, let's go back to our panel. We can see where we, where we marked. There it is. So you can see the entire thing now. It's important to note that I can adjust this. I can move all of these. If I'm not happy with where one of these went, I can move them. And I can move them not only in this panoramic quasi-sagittal sagittal coronal plane, but I could go in and I could move them in the actual sagittal plane. You know, as I cycle through, you can see where those points are in the yellow line. So mapping the nerve shouldn't be hard. It should be actually pretty simple. Shouldn't take you too much time. Um, should be fairly straightforward. Okay, so we got pathology here. Now, hopefully many of you have recognized what that probably is. I'm gonna delete this map again. Um, let's say I wanted to measure this. Um, this also kind of goes for measuring a dental implant. Let's say we have a spot here we wanna measure. So a couple of ways to measure. Easiest way is click measure, distance. You're gonna click once, click again. Okay, 13.7 millimeters. If I wanna get another measurement, Click, click. 
Now, you can scroll up to zoom. Okay, that's a right-click scroll. I think I'm on a, a Mac, so it's a little bit different, but you can scroll up to zoom. Um, I want to say it's a right-click and, and scroll up. Um, but then I can measure in different locations, and it's important to note that there is there's no warp, there's no elongation or foreshortening. This is measuring a precise distance to within a tenth of a millimeter because it's CVCT. So I can take that measurement, go back over here, and I can find where I just measured, and that measurement is going to be the same in all the planes that I measured. You can see little dots where I was measuring. So it doesn't matter necessarily if you are in one area or another, those measurements are still the same. So I can go in and, you know, depending on where I measured, I think it was 13.7 or something, so I may be in a different sagittal slice here. But it's accurate to a tenth of a millimeter. Um, okay, let's talk about, if I go back to diagnose, slice thickness. So right now, as I scroll to the left, it's a single slice. If I scroll to the right, you can see I'm adding millimeters. So now we're looking at a four millimeter slice, five millimeters, six, seven, eight. So you can look at a big thick slice if you want to. And it's important to note also, you can do this for the panoramic. You can increase the slice thickness so it looks more like a conventional, what you're used to seeing panoramic. So this is one of the reasons why oftentimes we think we have really nasty panos, right? So now we've got a 27 millimeter thick pano, right? So I can shrink that and bring it back to one slice, which is a half a millimeter, and get a really ugly pano. So play with that a little bit. You'll find a way that a place that works for you. Usually the focal trough is a couple centimeters on a conventional pano. But that, I mean, these panos should look really nice. The, I mean, honestly, 3D panos, if you've got a stable image, a good quality image, should look really nice. All right. Let's see. What else? Um, some, some adjustments. One of the things that I'll recommend, let me reset all this. One of the things I'll recommend to you uh, is find an adjustment that works for you. Now let's, let's look. See, I don't have very, very many tools that show up here on the, on the right side of the screen. Um, because currently the active screen is this 3D screen, right? So the moment I select one of these planar views, click, now I have more tools. Okay, the CRISP tool is one we already talked about. I tend to, when a patient comes in, or when an image comes up, I tend to want them a little bit lighter, and so I'll drag this level window down just a little, and I'm going to turn off the CRISP most of the time. Now remember, you can zoom in. Um, you can also, I don't have the functionality because I don't have a mouse plugged in, but you can also pan the image. Once you're zoomed in, you can pan the image around, kind of like with CEREC. Um, and let's talk about the um, smart focus. So you've got a smart focus tool that you can use right here, smart focus, which is the same as hitting the space bar. Let's just say I wanted to zoom in on this little opacity that I see. I'm going to click on that. It's going to take me right there. Okay, there's that opacity, right? So I'm going to uh, be able to do a lot more in this particular view. Let me move my head out of the way than in other views. You notice I now have an edit axis um, tool right here. So I can now rotate the image, not only in that uh, coronal view, but also in the sagittal view and in the axial view. So look at all the control I now have in looking at these images. And then you can scroll through and get a, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, a slice that you really like. You know, you want to look at exactly what's going on here with this opacity. You can scroll through, but don't forget about this. This is really, really cool, this um, 3D inspection tool. So I, I tend to find, uh, to spend a lot of time in this particular view looking at, um, you know, irregularities by rotating the images around like you're seeing here so that I can get a little better view because that tends to be really helpful. Gives you a really nice section or cut through whatever you're looking at. Uh, you can also grab and drag the uh, lines, if I can get it to do it. Uh, it may not be wanting to work right now. Sometimes my MacBook doesn't cooperate. Um, but you can do a whole lot with 
yeah, sorry, it's not cooperating right now, with the, the individual positioning the movement of these angles. Okay, what else? Oh, screenshot. Let's talk about screenshot a little bit. So let's say I pull this image up and I really want the patient to go home with a picture or to be able to take this to a you know oral surgeon or something. So let's talk about the screenshot capture, screenshot feature. So if you hit screenshot, now as you hover over different windows, it's going to highlight different ones, but it'll also highlight the entire thing. So you can take a screenshot of the whole, all four windows, or just one window, but you can't do just two, I don't think. So let's say I want to capture this window. I'm going to click on it, and now that window has been captured to recent images right here. Okay, now if I want to annotate, I like to point things out. So let's put a pointer there, and I'm going to add text, um, potential florid osseous osseous type dysplasia. I don't know if that's how you spell it. Anyway, so you can annotate it. You can also circle things with your pen. And you can, if you want to, you can go in there um, and you can change the colors, right? All sorts of fun things if you want to change the colors, right? We got green, we got red, whatever color you want to change it to. Let's see if that'll change. Let's see, it doesn't want to change. There it is, now it changed. So you can do all sorts of adjustments and edits here. You know, you can spend hours and hours doing this. You can also control all screen print like Dr. Sears was talking about and then mark it up in paint. That works fine too. Um, now one thing you'll need to know to print when you click on the screenshot image, and you could also do it from any of these areas. Print, that feature is everywhere. But let's just say I want to print off what I screenshotted. I have to be careful how I say that. You hit print right here. Um, if you want the patient's name on it, deselect that, hit apply. You'll get a little different window with a Windows computer. But one of the challenges we have is this. The computer, for whatever reason, the program, rather, defaults to A4 paper, which is really long, which we don't use in the United States. So you have to change that to letter. If you don't change it to letter, it'll just be sent to your printer, and it won't ever print because we don't have A4 paper loaded in our printers. Um, it's a bug in the system. My understanding is Cabo is working on it. Uh, Nobel's working on it. I don't know what the resolution time frame is. I voiced this concern about six months ago or so. Still haven't had a resolution. So hopefully they'll get on it. Anyway, change to letter then print. You can leave it on landscape if you want to be able to mark up, write notes on the bottom, that's fine too. Um, landscape portrait. But the key there is click on the drop down, hit print. Now one thing that's helpful too, if these dang lines get in the way, you can turn off the lines. Click the arrow, hide the info. Alright, click the arrow, hide the info. There's a lot of little simple tools that, uh, that will be helpful to you. So. Hopefully that's helpful stuff. If you have any questions, any concerns, don't hesitate to let me know. Let me move my head out of the way so you can see Dr. Steers' smiling face. I um, sure appreciate you taking the time to come to my lecture. Um, hopefully we'll have our lecture. Sorry, Dr. Steers and my lecture. Uh, again, this was put together initially by Dr. Pham. Grateful for him and his efforts. Um, please let us know. Let me know. Um, reply to this email. Send Dr. Steers or myself or Dr. Pham. Um, if there's additional data that you're interested in, um, there are a lot of resources on the CBCT landing page, again, that most of us aren't aware of. So dig around there a little bit. Um, there's a lots of training. Look at those flow charts and uh, the tools that, that's there and, and see what you can do to improve your skills. Um, it's a great tool. It's a great opportunity to help serve our patients. So thank you and have a great day.